I use stop to stop. I have to restart the stop. And I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and then I lost my train of thought. And it was, it was a miserable ending, and I apologize. So let me begin where I was going to go yesterday. And we'll play along, and this is the end of that panel. What I wanted to say, this is something I think is important in all storytelling, all the forms in it, maybe have some re 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 resonance and uh, meaning for those in the room. I was up very late. Uh, a lot of the discussion yesterday was about world building and giving information and revision and no one that talked about the important parts of all this, which is people actually don't want to be told a story. They don't want to hear a story. They want to experience a story. They want to be, be uplifted, ennobled, amused, entertained, scared, horrified, but not just bored, not just given information. And the best example that I have of that, because what you want to do is you want to look at the audience, like, and yourself, like, you know, this is the world's biggest game, biggest game of cat and mouse. You know, mousey in your throat. And the best example I can think of of that, how you are writing toward a reaction from the audience, because one of his job is to touch passion, not be burned by it, and come back and tell everyone else what it felt like, and light them up. So the example I was going to give was um, in, in Severed Dreams. How many have seen Severed Dreams? Oh, interesting. So um, that one five episode. Oh. And B-5 has been surrounded by Earth's ships they're about to lose, and these Bimbari ships come out and basically send all the Earth folks home. And when I first wrote the scene, it was informational. It was, okay, the Lent comes out, head of the fleet, says, um, this is Ambassador of the, of the Bimbari, uh, Babel 5 is under our protection, what's your army destroyed? And, okay, good. That's a good moment for the character, for the story, and it resonates in it's not enough. The audience will appreciate the moment, but they won't react to the moment. So I need to give her something more to do. Well, how do I do that? So I thought, okay, hang on. I need to have one of the Earth captains be a dick and say, you know, you know, you know we have authority here. You know, uh, don't go force us to open up fire on your ships. And I thought, okay, what is she going to say back in return? Well, why not is a good answer. <laughs> Then, okay, it's a good start. Where else can I go with that? Um, oh, she obviously doesn't know his history, so she will explain it to him by saying only one Earth captain has survived battle with a Minbari fleet. Good, good. I need to cap this somehow. I need to get the audience up on their feet. And he is behind me. You are in front of me. To value your lives, be somewhere else. And I put my fist up in the air, and I knew that the first time people heard that line being uttered on television, they would wet themselves. <laughs> Somebody that's in support of me, apparently. <laughs> there wouldn't be a dry seat in the house. I knew that. <laughs> and, and that's what writing is. It's, it's not just giving information and structuring things and outlining. It's having fun knowing the effect your work is going to have on the reader or on the audience. That's the joy of it. That's, the, that's what keeps me going, you know? And that's what I wanted to impart yesterday. And now, and now I can stop. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't worth your applause. Uh, so actually, I'm to San Diego. I used, to, I used to live in San Diego for quite a while, um, in my younger years, during the early Cretaceous period. And um, I actually worked, uh, I lived in Chula Vista, and I worked at the Chula Vista Public Library. This is a totally true story. And my job was twofold. One, I was there to pack up books and put them back on the shelves. That was secondary to the main job, which was being a shusher. I was to walk around and people were being loud. I was to shush them. That's right. I was a bouncer at the library. <laughs> I'm a badass that way. 
Um, it was pretty important on, on Friday and Saturday nights because you know, young women were there, were there trying to study and do their homework and research. And there was guys either making trouble or making noise or hitting on them. And my job was to you know, tell them to knock it off or, or throw them out. And mind you, I was 140 pounds as six foot four. So, of course, it was next to a police station, so that was kind of okay. Uh, and so it was one night, uh, there were these three guys who were just mercilessly going around and just hitting on women. I said, look, you need to leave. And I didn't want to leave. I said, look, the cops are next door. It's a three and a half minute walk. And you, you're going to go now or I'm going to make that walk. And they left. So closed up for the day, for the night, I should say. It was like 8, eight o'clock. And I walked up to a um, coffee shop. Uh, she was uh, uh, four blocks away. And I walk into the coffee shop, <clears throat> and I see the three guys that are sitting there. And they, they see me, and I see them, but nobody does anything. I just want to get a cup of coffee and get out of here before, you know, the bus, when the bus comes. I, I don't drive. I've never driven. Um, no one to know why, I'll tell you later on. Hmm. So I'm waiting for the bus, and having coffee, and looking at my watch, and hiding it down. I figure I'll walk out like two minutes before the bus is due, and I'll get on, and everything will be fine. So it's almost that time, I go to the restroom, come back, finish up my coffee, and they're gone, by the way, at this point. Okay, I'm okay, I can go home. And they finish the last sip of coffee, see a little bit of piece, a piece of paper floating on the bottom. And I recognize it because I had friends who did, you know, acid. And this is window pane acid, which has strychnine in it to enhance the, uh, the effects. And I think I have maybe 15, 20 minutes before this kicks in. So I got on the bus and I'm you know, making sure that you know, I can get home in one piece and I get back and it was just the night of horrors. <laughs> um, but, but that one, one incident aside, you know, I don't, I'd also be mugged later on by some other guys. Uh, I've, I've always loved San Diego. It's my favorite place in the country. And it is. And actually, why you blew it up? <laughs> Every relationship has ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> and those of you who live in San Diego may be seeing more of me than you might think in the coming year. Um, so to get into the, the nuts and bolts of what I'm here to talk about, um, really the nuts. Um, so I finished my cap run, I'm now done with that. And I wanted to tell certain stories that's done now and Captain America, and I wanted to finish with one big-ass story, a three-issue issue story. The three characters I've written for the most at Marvel were Spider-Man, Thor, and Captain America. So I wanted to do a story with all three of those, the New Warriors three. And what always annoyed me, I understand why they did it, but when I did my Thor run, I had them put Asgard in the middle of the country in, Bro in, in Broxton, Oklahoma. Which when I first said it to Marvel, I said, why would you put Asgard in Oklahoma? Well, first off, for the, the visual distinction, you know, flat, 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 Asgard, flat, flat, flat. Hmm. Uh, but also, my thought was that putting a god next to a, a mortal makes him more powerful and at the same time makes him more accessible. Whereas Thor next to Iron Man or someone else, there isn't that much of a difference, you know. And about a year after I left the book, uh, they, they destroyed Broxton. Maybe you, well, some people are comic fans know about this. Uh, for reasons that, from the character side, I thought were kind of arbitrary. And never sat right with me. I, I liked that town and the people who were there. Uh, and I liked the relationship we had between um, uh, Kelda, one of the, 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 the Marlo, Marlo old goddess, and the, the Frank Cook, who worked at the cafe in, in Broxton. And they had this, they were in love with each other, he couldn't figure out why, you know, would, would this ever work? And, you know, they're encouraging him, no, it's okay, it, 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 love can conquer all. And his line was, you know, well, my dad used to say, you know, a fish can love a bird, but where would they build a house together? And uh, Dr. Blake says, uh, on the edge of the river. Uh, and uh, I love that, and it blew it up. Uh, so I bring Broxton back. <laughs> Just because it, it annoyed me, so they said the Marvel time, bring back Broxton and bring, make it live again. You know, sure, you can do that. So that's going to be my big three issue arc to finish up my cap run. In addition to all this, um, three years ago I became the executor of the Harlan Ellison estate. My friend Harlan and his wife Susan 
passed away, she two years after him. And it had always bothered me that Harlan's name had kind of fallen off the grid because he got tired of dealing with editors who weren't necessarily up to what he had in mind, so he began self-publishing, which, you know, filled in the gaps in the corners financially, but didn't have the mainstream reach, so some of the editions that they made would sell like, you know, a thousand copies or a few hundred copies, which kept them going, but it didn't reintroduce him or introduce him to new readers. And he hadn't been in mainstream bookstores in about 20 years. And I resolved to change that because his work, how many of you have seen Harlan uh, before uh, this guy or others? Yeah, his work needs to be remembered, not sure, but also brought back to life because what he had to say was important and is important, particularly now. And new generation needs to hear that. So I made a deal with Double with them by Barnes and Noble to um, do a book of Harlan's greatest hits. And everyone at first who I said I was going to do this, they said, you know, look, all these stories have been out before in various editions. They've never been collected together before like this, but if you, if you sell 10,000 copies, you're going to be lucky. No, 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 there's an audience here. I swear to God, I know it will make this happen. And the book came out. It's a large, thick paperback. Uh, and it went, uh, it went to a second printing before it even hit the stands. And the exclusive edition also went to a second edition. We have now, according to what I've been told from the folks at the, the publishing house, there are in, in the vicinity of 60,000 copies now in print. And that's, that's kind of cool for a guy who has been you know, out of it for a while. And the, the fun part is that seeing this whole new generation adopting him. Uh, those of you who are on TikTok, I'm sorry for all of you. <laughs> a moment. Adopted Harlan. And there's, there's just hundreds of TikTok videos about Harlan drawing on his old videos and his work and, and how much they love him and they're doing drawings about him and memes about him. And I thought, what, what the hell is going on here? You know, there, there was that whole about the sex symbol, you know. Um, and, and I started, started reaching out to some of them saying, what, what, this is huge. I mean, two years ago, you couldn't find you know, one or two uh, tweets in a, in a month about Harlan. It's just older readers. Now there's every day these younger generations talking about it. Millennials, Gen Z, and Alphas. And I said, why? And what they said was that in their schools now, the books have been so heavily censored and limited because of political pressures of one sort or another that everything they get is been soft and mealy and the corners have all been chopped off. And here comes Harlan Ellison, who doesn't give a shit, you know, and embraces controversy, and embraces saying things that, you know, will galvanize you. And, and they've taken him <coughs> to their heart. Um, and there's spleen in their kidneys, in other words. Um, there was a, a story I started to tell last time I was here to do the um, Road Home promotion about Harlan and uh, attempted burglary at his house, but I stopped myself. As I recall, I didn't tell that story. But then who was here to the room? Is that confirmed? I don't know. I'll tell it anyway. I think, I, I think what happened was I talked about the road home, and I said, I started the story, and I stopped it. Uh, not the place for it. So after I became executive of Harlan's estate, the first thing I had to do was to secure his house. Because the house is a work of art. It has towers, it has secret rooms, one of which he used to hide draft dodgers during the Vietnam War. Um, it's got gargoyles based on Richard Nixon and Phil Schlafly <laughs> and all the figures in the far right back when it was uh, very active. And so whenever Harlan wanted to build something new in the house and there was a part of the alarm system in the way, he would pull out the alarm system. So all he had was a chime on the front door. So we had to fix this right now because there's no one in the house. So I put in, immediately when ACS put in, um, uh, door alarms and that sort of thing to start off and then we would later put in more stuff. And by the way, now there are motion sensors, cameras, door alarms, motion sensors outside, cameras outside and inside. We have pulse cannons. <laughs> um, ain't nobody in, in that house. But at that time, all we had was the door alarms. 
the window alarms. So I got those in first. Okay, great. Now we can work on the rest of it. And it was a, a Friday night, about two in the morning. And I got a call from ACS saying there's a, the, an alarm at the house. I'm like 15 minutes away, so I zoom out to the house. And what had happened is they had come, they had broken through a patio door. And when you walk into Harlan's house, it is sensory overload. Everything you remember as a child that you enjoyed or had fun with or brought you pleasure or meant something to you, it's all in his house. Uh, every inch of every wall is covered. There's a quarter of a million books by count. Um, there's a room dedicated entirely to mugs. This is cups and mugs for an entire room. And so I'm sure when they saw that, they went, oh my god, we hit the jackpot. They began pulling stuff together, but they got the alarm, and by the time we got there, they split and they dropped the bag of stuff they were carrying out, so we got to go recover that. And that was it, and everything was fine, and I had the door closed up, and no problem. So, but now it's like 5 o'clock in the morning, and I'm all wired up, and uh, I can't sleep. Well, I'll just stay up until late tonight, my work in the evening anyway. So Saturday night, 1 a.m., ACS calls. We had another alert from a glass break from one of the offices. So, boom, I go back into the ACS guys, and they couldn't tell if they were just cracking stress or some trying to climb up on the roof when they hit up with a rock or testing the system. But, you know, if I look at everything and it's okay, if I go back, and now it's again 4 a.m., and I'm still too tired to go to sleep, you know, if that makes any sense. So I stay up again. And then, Sunday night, and I told the security guys to make more patrols just in case there's a problem. So Sunday night, just as I'm going to go to bed, ACS calls and says, is there anyone supposed to be in the house? No, said I, with the ellipses and the question mark. Why do you ask? Well, one of our guys checked the house and knocked on the front door and someone yelled out, get the fuck out of here. This is not a good sign. Uh, so I said, you know, call the cops. I'll be there as fast as I can. Boom, back up the house. And I'm talking to the ACS guys waiting for the cops to show up. And they said they saw a couple of people running out of the house down this like, gully behind the house. And we're yelling back at them. And the word gun came up in the discussion. So now the cops get there. And then we mentioned that the word gun was mentioned. Now they have to armor up. Another cop car shows up. And they ask me for the key. And I hesitate because the house is my responsibility, first and foremost. And I said, no, no, it's okay, I'll go first. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, why, yes, sir, I am, officer. So imagine a conga line leading up to the door, me in the front of the door, and six of the cops with body armor behind me, hands on guns. And I turn the lock, I push the door, and it stops. Like there's someone behind it holding it back or something. And my very first thought is, I just made a terminal error. <laughs> I figure, I'll push it really hard, knock down whatever, whoever this is. I push really hard, I hear a shh sound. I look around the corner with a flashlight, and there's two suitcases filled with swag that they had just been packing up by the door. They put them by doors and windows and literally were just in the process of, of about to have a car swing by probably and get this, they're professionals. And, and 10 more minutes they would have been gone. So we go into the house <coughs> and the cops are checking everything and, and they say, we should know all there's hidden rooms. There's hidden rooms. There's no drugs, man. I'm telling you. But it's not <laughs> to do that shit. <coughs> and we go up to the second floor where Susan's office was and there's one window there that um, they broke through that was not armed because it's way up there. And they shattered the window and broke the frame and got in from there and they came down and was very careful to avoid detection. So I fill out the paperwork, takes on over to the cops, realize that nothing was stolen, we're all, we're all good, and leave. But now I think, hang on a second, that window cannot be closed now. I am having people come later, but this can't be closed for the next four hours. It's now like four o'clock in the morning. If I leave, they'll just come back and finish the job. They said, leave all the bags as they are for a fingerprint. Yeah. 
if I stayed, a gun was mentioned. I stay. I get a flashlight. I get a pair of scissors. Because whoever comes to that window is going to lose an eye. <laughs> and then I sit there by that window from four in the morning until dawn. Uh, and at one point I heard noise on the roof. I thought, okay, this is it. It was just a raccoon. Um, but uh, finally, dawn broke, and I got the contract with it. It's closed it up. Uh, but the whole time I'm sitting there waiting for death. You think Harlan did it to me again? <laughs> he fucking did it to me again. Uh, so now that the publishing is in gear and the book has done really, really well, I'm talking about the next edition of that, putting out its prior anthologies, and I want to get to phase two, which would be getting some movies and TV shows done based on his work, and we're in discussions now for that to happen. So he is now more or less in place. And I'm very happy about that. And the best thing is that you know, when when I go to dust, which will be sometime around tomorrow at two o'clock, um, his work will live on. And, and there will be generations now that the, the, the younger folks now have discovered his work, they will carry it forward, and he will continue. And that's what you want as your writer. You, know, you want your work to live on, and that will be done. Um, in terms of my own work, uh, I just recently did a audio drama. Uh, for Earthlight, called Earthlight, for Penguin Random House, they want to move on to doing just uh, audio books, to audio dramas, and they want someone to be the spirit, tip of the spear on that, so they might form rank naturally. Uh, and we're actually having a panel about that later on today with one of the producers who is um, uh, Robin Atkin Downs, who worked with me on Babylon 5, also a very well known voice actor, so he'll be there as well. Uh, I recently just, it was just announced a few weeks ago that I adapted Watchmen to an animated movie for Warner Bros. Which is coming out, I think, in about three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, you know, I, I, I didn't see any reason to change Alan's words or add to them with my own. It's, it's there, it just needed to be adapted to a different form. So that's what I did with this. So if you're looking for any, any JMSs, you will, you will find them there. And working on the novel, which I can't talk about yet, but I'm very excited about it. Those are the, the big hits for the for the moment. What I'd like to do, now that all the status stuff is done, the most fun that I have at these convers at these panels is to have a conversation with you. Which is both if you like cartoons, movies, books, music, I demand you subscribe to this channel. Subscribe, be prepared to subscribe or be prepared for do. Do not resist. Do not resist. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe.